brethren, I think you all realize with what's happening right here in Charlotte and around the country, very severe trials are coming, and they're already starting to happen right here. We've had riots the last few nights right here in Charlotte, which is astonishing. The Wall Street Journal had a headline showing how our image has been ruined. Charlotte used to be considered a very Christian, nice, quiet, cultured city. Now the images are going all around the world of riots right here. There have been riots, of course, recently in Oklahoma, in Tulsa, where they had the shooting as well. There have been riots in, in Baton Rouge and Houston and elsewhere as well. We know that. But our country is being torn apart. We have the most disliked and distrusted nominees for president of the United States that we've had in modern times, perhaps ever in the history of this country. God said he will set over us the least of the people. And we're having to live through that time. It's interesting how that's happening right here in the United States, right now. And God is allowing us, because we've turned aside from him, to go down and down and down in many, many different directions. We've got to be sure that these riots don't make us get upset at anyone, and certainly not at one another in God's church. Satan would like to divide and conquer. That's his tactic, divide and conquer. So who do we want to hate? Do we want to hate the people that are causing the riots? Do we want to hate the Russians that are getting ready to attack us, perhaps, or taking parts of Eastern Europe? Should we hate the Muslims and what they're doing around the world, beheading people, torturing people? Who should we hate? We're not to hate anybody. And we need to deeply understand that what God has called us to be, we must not let anyone take our crown. God warns us of that. Don't let anyone take your crown for any reason. So we've got to learn to really walk with God. And brethren, we've got to learn to walk and live by faith. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10, if you would, with me. Hebrews chapter 10 in your Bible. We're entering into very, very dangerous times because God says in Matthew 24, we're going to have wars and rumors of wars. We're going to have trouble and strife between ethnos, between different ethnicities, which could be different races of people. We're going to have wars between religions. We're going to have war. We're going to have upset weather. We're going to have st terrible storms and tornadoes and earthquakes such as have never been in human history. And we're going to have terrible disease epidemics. And people are going to have to come to either die or trust in God and know that God is real. And in many ways, God is going to begin to show that he is real, that he is God. And people are going to have to learn to understand that and trust in him. But back in the book of Hebrews, if you turn there with me, in Hebrews I'm, I'm, uh, chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 35, the Apostle Paul, writing to the older Christians at the headquarters church in Israel, in Jerusalem, said, Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. After you've done the will of God, but we certainly need to do the will of God first. For you have need of endurance, for yet a little while, he who is coming will come. Christ is coming back. He will come. We have not understood the dates perfectly, and no one on the earth has, but he will come. And all the things that he's ever said in this work, the big prophecies, and certainly the things that God says have come about, or are coming about, or soon will come about, he will come. Now the just shall live by faith. And my brethren, I want you to understand that today. That's a command. The just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my, we have, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Then he goes on to describe what faith is. And faith is really deep profound trust in God, as you see all the way through this passage. I'm going to give you this two or three times because in all the 36 years I spent with Mr. Herbert Armstrong over and over and over, he often described verses in the Bible that said things specifically about faith. 
But the overall thing that I learned from this and from what I've seen in my own life as well, that you've got to know and know that you know that God is real. You've got to prove that, and you can do that if you're interested in it at all. And that the Bible is his inspired revelation. You must know that. And then you've got to know that God loves us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. And he tells us that. And for 67 years of trials and tests in the work of God, I've seen that over and over. God will never leave us nor forsake us. And then you've got to know that God will do. Remember it says here, he will come. You've got to know that God will do what he has said that he will do. And Mr. Armstrong repeated that over and over, kind of a brief definition of faith. God will do. Know that God is real, that he loves us, that he will never forsake us, and that God will do. He absolutely will do what he has said that he will do. He does not always do it in the exact time or way that we thought, but he will do it. And you've got to learn that. And the more you walk with God, you will see that. It's real. It happens. It's going to happen. It's going to continue to happen. So it's a very important principle of God. God will do whatever he said that he will do. And there's no exception, no exception when you understand it. Turn to Revelation chapter 21 now. We're entering a time of trial. Most of you know that, I hope, by now, the things that are happening in the whole world, not just here at, Tul at Charlotte or Tulsa, but all over the world, the terrible upsets. Millions of people are wondering, where is God? These immigrants who've had to flee Africa and the Middle East to try to find a place to live, and now they're not allowed to go into the various nations because some of them are criminals, of course, and have caused trouble. It's a very difficult situation. They're wondering, what, where's my next meal coming from? Where am I going to sleep tonight? Is there a God? Many are about to starve to death. Many have already starved to death. People wonder. They don't know God. But here it is, for those of you who do understand, God says back in Revelation chapter 21, verse 7, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. We're males and females, and we're grateful for that. But in the in the resurrection will be primarily called sons because God is neither male nor female. The masculine tends to predominate. God is not a Mrs. God is a father. We will be sons of God, full sons of God, just like God himself with total power, total wisdom, and total love and mercy and compassion. But the cowardly, notice verse 8, the cowardly and unbelieving, Notice the first two things that God puts there describing people that are in trouble. Those who are cowardly, they just cannot seem to bring themselves to trust God. And the unbelieving, those who will not walk by faith, the unbelieving, abominable, murders, sexually immoral. If you don't trust in God, all these things will start coming forth in your life. It's happening throughout the United States sorceries, this, uh, idolaters, and all liars. That's something God hates, people that will not tell the truth. They're constantly watering things down. How do you know when a politician is lying? When they open their mouth. You know, that old definition, but it's too bad. All liars, God says, will be in the lake of fire, which burns with fire, and brimstone, which is the second death. He starts right out, but the cowardly and unbelieving, those who refuse to put their trust in God, wow, that's important to God. If you're going to live forever in his kingdom, you'd better believe that he is, that he has all power in the universe, that he has love, and that he will do what he has said that he will do. You want to build on that, build that, that, that thought into your brain. Build that idiom into your brain, so to speak. It's a very, very important thing to God that you have that attitude and learn to walk by faith. I'm going to give you four keys to help you learn to walk by faith. I want you, and God wants you, to learn to walk by faith. First of all, really study. Don't just carelessly read. Just skim over a few psalms or read the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd and feel good. No, study. 
this book. Drink in of it. Feed on it. Saturate your mind with it. Go over it again and again where you learn to think like God and have the mind of God. Study the Bible. And God tells you that over and over again. So he wants us to learn to do that. And of course, that's it's described back in, in, in Romans uh, 10. If you turn there with me, Romans, the book of Romans, and turn to verse 17. God tells us that we are, that faith comes by hearing the word of God. Romans 10 and verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing the word of God and hearing by the word, by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you hear the word of God, you read it, you study it, you drink in of it. That gives you the way God thinks and that helps you build faith. And boy, I wish I'd studied the Bible even more as I was growing up. You think you studied it a lot, Mr. Meredith. Yes, I had, because I've been blessed to be in the ministry. But so many books are written about the Bible, but it's far, far more important to read and study the Bible itself. So many people in the Protestant seminaries come out, or the Catholic seminaries, of course, they read about their church traditions. The Protestant seminaries have their traditions, and then all this liberal stuff. They don't study the Bible. In the early years of Ambassador College, the overwhelming majority of the teaching was reading right from the Bible over and over again. And that really helped me and will help all of you who learn to do that. Study the Bible because it is the revelation of the way God thinks, and you'll begin to have faith by doing that a very great deal. Also learn to trust in the answers from the Bible. You want to under, understand how God does answer prayer. Remember back in Daniel 6, Daniel 6, verses 10 to 23, it describes how Daniel went into a private place to pray when the king said, you're going to do this or I'm going to throw you in the lion's den. You see how God answered. There's so many answers we give in the Bible, of course, to build faith, what God did do. And certainly we need to read those examples over and over, like Daniel chapter 3, verses, six, verses uh, 16 to 28, where it shows how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would refuse to bow down before this great idols of the king. And it shows how God saved them. When did he save them? When it was too late. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sometimes it seems like God is not hearing your prayer. But ask yourself, am I dead is it too late for God to save me? No. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego felt themselves being picked up. They felt themselves being thrown into this, this uh, fiery furnace. They could feel the heat. Must have been horrible heat. And in their own minds, they were human. They must have thought it's too late. We're going to obey God anyway, but we're going to burn alive. And suddenly, they looked around and they were not burning alive. And as the king looked into the pit, he said, there's a fourth personality in there. Who is that? Who is that? This fourth person, this fourth, this other man that was in there. It probably was the Christ of the Old Testament walking right there with them. It was not too late. It's never too late for God. So those examples ought to build faith as we believe that trust of the way of God is very important. But also, you read other examples of different kinds all the way through the Old Testament. Back in 2 Chronicles, you might write this down. It's a wonderful example to build faith. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 to 24, shows how Jehoshaphat was surrounded by a vast group of armies, overwhelmingly stronger. He had to call a fast, called a fast for the whole nation. They cried out to God. And God heard them in a magnificent way, and all their enemies turned out dead. It's amazing. Read it. God answers in an overwhelming way sometimes that we don't always understand or expect. But then it's important, brethren, that you understand as well some of the more recent examples of faith. And I hope that you guys have reviewed some of them with you. Let me give you a few of these again. When I first came to Ambassador College, I saw many miracles taking place. Mr. Armstrong went around with an attitude of faith and trust in God in an unusual way. And we had healings after healings after healings of just normal things. 
But not too many years after I graduated, my dear friend Dick Armstrong laid hands on Howard Clark. And I've told you that, how Howard was my age exactly and sitting in a wheelchair as I would preach from the Shakespeare Club stage. He was sitting right along there in the wheelchair year after year. It wasn't some temporary thing. It was five or seven years he was there. He was a quadriplegic. He couldn't move his hands or feet or anything. He just had to sit in that chair. He always had a smile. He seemed to go along, get along fine. He trusted in God at that point in his life. And after the day of Pentecost in 1958, I was coming back from Chicago for Pentecost, and a young student came out, and he said, after he was to pick me up at the airport, he said, Mr. Meredith, have you heard that Howard Clark has been healed? I said, what? I could hardly believe it because I had personally baptized Howard Clark, and I had to have two other men help me pick him up and put him in the baptistry. He was my height, but he was about 50 pounds heavier, probably weighed 200, he probably more than that, probably 70 pounds heavier. He got very heavy. He was bigger bone, but couldn't move, so he had gained weight. We had to lift him carefully to get him over the hump and into the baptistry, and God healed him through the prayers of Richard David Armstrong over Pentecost, in 1958. Supernaturally healing. It's amazing. And yet many people somehow today forget it. Even the brethren who saw it, they kind of take it for granted after a while. And that was awesome. One of the early things in my ministry that I saw happen, which inspired me, modern miracles of things that would be looked on as impossible. There's a later in the Salt Lake City Church called Mrs. Beam, like a beam in the ceiling. She had been attending. Her husband was in the church, but she was not a member. But she had breast cancer and went to this specialist in the hospital there. They had a big hospital. She had to just go to a chiropractor, a dentist. She went to cancer specialist, but she died. One breast was removed, and then she died. I'm sorry, one breast was removed. I'm taking this wrong, kind of hurrying along here. Then she began to attend church. That shook her. She began to attend church, and then the cancer moved into the other side. You say, why would God do that? Well, it was probably to help people's faith. God knew what he was going to do. Then the thing began to hurt and hurt and hurt, and she was crying out and screaming and grabbing the, the walls, hurting so badly, and asked for the minister to pray. She still wasn't healed. Finally, one night, with the ladies staying around with her, taking care of her, bathing her, changing her, because she had to be tossing back and forth in her bed. She was in constant pain. She said to the minister, please ask God to heal me or let me die right now. I've heard that a number of times from the minister and for her himself. I talked to her later. I flew up to Salt Lake City. I said, I want to see this. I came out from Missouri. I came out to check up on Mr. Armstrong partly, and I saw that he was the man of God. And so these ladies saw her healed right then after the minister prayed. They were crying. They were praying. And I said, did God heal her right now, right immediately? And they said, no. It was kind of a test because for 60 or 90 seconds, even, you know, one, two, three, four, five times 12 is only 60 seconds. It seemed like an eternity. She was going like this. And all of a sudden they said, her hands went out, and she looked up. She said, it's gone. It's gone. And it was gone. She was healed. She went right back to the cancer specialist. Her body began to excrete these tissues coming right out that had been cancerous before, and God supernaturally healed her. A little bit later, in Ambassador College, one of my married students came to class right after the freshman class was over. But he came up to apologize to me. I met him in the hallway there, and he said, Dr. Meredith, he said, I'm sorry for not coming to class today. I barely made it here. But he said, I had to be home with my little daughter. She's dying right now. She was dying of this terrible disease that was going around, and I, he asked me to come out and heal her and pray for her. She'd been anointed by some local elders, but it keep getting worse. That doesn't mean an evangelist always is needed, but in this case, he asked for me. And she had the fatal form of spinal meningitis. 
I had read the papers, as my family knows, I read the papers maybe too much, but all these things were in the Los Angeles Times about how this fatal variety of spinal meningitis was sweeping around the city at that time. That's what she had. It was deathly. And I prayed with all my heart because her mother was crying. Her dad had tears in his eyes. I beseech God to heal this beautiful little girl. She was just three or four years old. And when I went, she hadn't been healed yet, but she seemed to be conked out. She went to sleep at least. The next day, her mother called me. She said, Mr. Meredith, she said, my daughter lay there for a while. I thought something was wrong. She was just asleep. She slept for about 13 or 14 hours. Then she woke up feeling good. The cancer was gone, or the, the, the meningitis was gone. The fever was gone, and she wanted something to eat, and now she's fine. God healed her. God does heal supernaturally. It's not in some tent meeting, hooping and hollering, but if we quietly believe that God is real, that God is there, that God will do what he has said that he will do, absolutely, we can get answer after answer today, not just back in the time of King Jehoshaphat, not just back in the time of Daniel, today. We've got to know that and learn to walk and live by faith in every facet of our lives. That's a very, very important thing. So we need to understand that and have faith in God, read his word, and focus on the fact that God will heal today. Look on the old examples of God's answered prayer and the more recent examples in our day today. And that's a very, very important thing to learn to live by faith. And certainly we need to constantly focus on that. So I've given you Mr. Herbert Armstrong's definition of faith. I'll keep repeating that from time to time. Brethren, be sure that in your own way, you learn that God is real. There is a creator for this creation. This is his inspired revelation to man. Believe that he's real. Believe that he's all powerful. Believe that he loves you. And believe that he will do what he has said that he will do. If you believe that, really believe that, focus on that, you'll begin to learn to walk and to live by faith. So another thing to help you build faith, big key number two, is always focus on the big picture. Sometimes people get disoriented. For instance, they'll hear about the riots here, and then they'll get mad at the blacks, or mad at the whites, or mad at the police, or mad at the establishment, or mad at somebody, and somehow give up on God and forget how God's involved in all these things. He is the overall ruler of the world. If they forget about the big picture, Constantly think about the big picture, brethren. That's so important. Turn back with me now, if you would, to Psalm 33. Psalm 33, one of my favorite passages in all the Bible. He says here in verse 10 of Psalm 33, the eternal brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. They have all these great big United Nations councils, big councils and meetings in Washington, D.C., and London, and Berlin, and elsewhere. He brings to nothing. They've never brought world peace. They never will. He makes the plans of the people of no effect. The counsel of the eternal stands forever. The plans of his heart to all the generations. Blessed is that nation whose God is the ever-living one, Yahweh, the one who lives forever, the one with life inherent within himself. Blessed is that nation who really believes in the true God and the people whom he's chosen as his inheritance. The eternal looks down from heaven. So God is looking right down right now, watching you and watching me, watching this service. He's watching his people on this earth, wherever they are. He looks down from heaven upon the sons of men. From the place of his habitation, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. Each one of you is being fashioned and molded in an intricate way by God. He will try to knock off the rough edges. He will try to teach you and me every lesson we need to learn if we're willing, if we're seeking God, serving God with the best of our ability, with God's help, obeying God, and learning to literally walk by faith in every single part of our lives. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. No king is saved by a multitude of an army 
or by great strength or a big horse or a tank or whatever. Behold, the eye of the ever living one is on those who fear him, who have that awe of God, on those who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep alive him alive in famine. Our soul waits for the eternal. He is our help and shield, for our heart shall rejoice in him. Why? Why will our heart learn to rejoice in God finally, all of us? Because we have trusted in his holy name. You will have to learn to really trust in him. Know he's there. Know he's alive. Know he is El Shaddai. God Almighty, nothing can stop his purpose. And that he will do what he has said that he will do. You are blessed if you learn to trust in his holy name. Let your mercy, O eternal, be upon us, just as we hope in you. This is a wonderful passage in your Bible. You study it and learn to follow through with the obvious implications. You will be blessed. Turn now, if you would, to Philippians. Turn to the book of Philippians, if you would. Chapter 2, back in your New Testament, the book of Philippians. Chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 tells us in verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven. We're citizens of the United States, technically. We should salute the flag. We should pay our taxes. We should pray for our rulers that God will guide them in the right way. We're not to ask God to bless them in every way necessarily, but ask God to guide them in the right way to preserve peace and order. Certainly, we're to honor those in authority. But our ultimate citizenship is what? It's in heaven because the kingdom of God is headquartered right there. Christ, the coming king, is there. Our ultimate loyalty, our ultimate citizenship is in heaven from, it's from heaven, from which we also earnestly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, Someday, these rebellious arms and legs, as we get older, the things that seem wrong with so many of us are going to be gone. We will have a brand new body, a glorious body, according to the working by which he is able to sub subdue all things to himself. So our citizenship is in heaven. We belong to the heavenly kingdom. We do not belong. We're not Americans in the sense that we want to fight other nations. We're not fight whites in the sense we want to fight blacks. We're not this group or that group, harmly speaking. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are all sons of God, and we owe our ultimate allegiance there, and we in God's church are all brethren. We are all brethren. There's neither male nor female nor black or white or anything like that in Christ. We're all one in Christ, as God tells us. So we want to really understand that. That's our ultimate loyalty. That's who we are. We must constantly not, not think in these normal, carnal human terms. We've got to be bigger than that. Then we can see God's overall purpose being worked out and not get disoriented and not get turned aside into local fights and feuds, not get upset at our neighbor because he's carnal, but to know that we are called out from this. We are not to trust in the world around us, but to trust in God. Now, the third big key to walk by faith is to beseech God for faith and courage. And I'm not just talking about a bedtime prayer. Mr. Herbert Armstrong said, and I think I've told you this a number of times. He said a number of times, he said, fellows, talking to the ministry, he said, I think that one of the biggest lacks in our church today, in the whole church of God, is that we do not put our hearts in our prayers Many have grown up in Protestantism or Catholicism where you mumble something. I was taught by my parents to say, now I lay me down to sleep. And then I'd say, bless daddy, bless mother, bless Patty, bless Catherine, bless Poochie the dog, and so on, and go to bed. Nice thoughts to have in your mind as a little boy. Nothing wrong with that. But as you get older, you'd better learn to get more serious to know that you're talking to the governor of the universe. You're talking to the God who has all power. You're talking to the one whose face shines like the sun. You're talking to one who has the power in his voice like rolling thunder to shake the nations with his voice. And yet the one who has all the love there is, who sent his son to die for you, who wants you, who loves you, 
who's fashioning and molding you, who wants you to be with him and with Jesus forever in his family, forever in the kingdom of God. You've got to trust in him and know that he is there. So you want to be sure that you know those things and focus on those things and have the and beseech God that God for faith and courage. Turn with me if you would now to Psalm, no, to Luke chapter 22. Luke, if you would, chapter 22. Here's the example, the best example, of course, in the world. Jesus Christ himself as he was facing death. Luke chapter 22, and let's begin reading here in verse 40. He was coming out away from the temple. He went to the Mount of Olives. And when he came to the place, he, he came to the, this Gethsemane garden, no doubt. He said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. The Romans, the Jews were sending this army, this detachment of troops to grab him, to arrest him, and to bring him to where he was going to be tortured and crucified. He said, pray. We've got to constantly pray and cry out to God, knowing that the time may come, they're going to come after us. They're going to come after us. We will go through trials. Some of us will be thrown in jail. Some of us will be martyred. And we need to understand that. And some of us are old and will die. And I've told you many times, and I repeat again, don't any of you ever give up or turn aside. If I should die, you say, well, Mr. Meredith gave a sermon, and the next day he died. God killed him. No, God didn't kill me. He let me live 16 years older than King David, who was, six, who was 16 years younger than me when he died, old and full of days at age 70. So God has given me a long and wonderful life. So you let, don't anyone turn aside from things like that. Don't ever do that. Hang right in there. But he said, pray. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. He went way over about 100 yards or so among some bushes or trees and knelt down and prayed, Father, if this is your will, remove this cup from me, this terrible trial, they used to call it a hemlock cup, you know, it had a cup of poison. Some people were put to death by being forced to drink a cup of poison, which they would often do because if they didn't drink it, they'd be tortured. They preferred to just die of poison than to be tortured. Don't, he said, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. A total surrender to look to God and to God alone. Then an angel appeared. God had mercy on him. He was still in the human flesh. He was trembling with anxiety, humanly speaking, apparently. An angel came and strengthened him. And verse 44, read this one carefully, brethren, in your own Bible study. Go back over it from time to time. Here's the Son of God, Christ himself, being in an agony. He knew death, a horrible death was coming. Can you imagine if you had seen men up and down the Appian Way in Rome or elsewhere, where Jesus was not there, of course, but where he was, they had people crucified all the time. He saw them hanging there, shaking, screaming in agony, nails in their hands and their feet, their bodies swelling up, and where their, their, swelling, their, their stomach fluids would swell up and poison and burst through the stomach wall. What a horrible way to die. Some of them hooked five or six days before they died. And his mercy let God, God only let Christ live six hours until the Roman soldier threw a spear in his side. But he had to cry out to God. So he prayed more earnestly. He put his heart in his prayers. Notice, and his sweat became great drops of blood falling down to the ground. They say that in terrible trauma, the blood vessels will burst and some blood will come out right with the, the, right with the perspiration. And your perspiration will look like blood. That's what happened to Christ. He prayed so fervently, crying out to God, help me, help me, oh God. I'm the only one who could make it. I'm the only one who could save the world. If I give up, who's going to die for this world? But I can't do it by myself. Help me. He cried out with his whole being. So he cried out with great power, with great feeling, and his great blood fell down to the ground like sweat fell down to the ground like blood. When he rose up for prayer and came back to his disciples, 
and he found them sleeping for sorrow. They didn't get it. How many of you don't get it? You come here to church, you're good, you put on your Sabbath smile, and you go back and continue living as if nothing had ever happened. We are living at the time of the end. These things are speeding up. This nation is going down. The British Empire is not only gone, Britain itself will be gone. Our brethren over there in Britain and the British, former British Empire, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, these nations that are the Anglo-Saxon people, we've been blessed by God so much. And now the blessings are being taken away. Every year it's going to get worse and worse and worse unless we repent and turn back to God, the real God of the Bible, and are willing to do what he says. But everything indicates that won't be until Christ comes and, and shakes the nations. He's going to have to shake them until their teeth rattle. Why? When he first comes back, you know it, back in Revelation 17, they're going to fight him. The armies of the beast, millions of young men and women in this terrible army over there are going to literally be fighting Christ himself. That's how totally Satan has deceived the world. They literally fight the Son of God. You talk about being deceived while they're deceived. And if you were living there as a slave at that time, you might be all mixed up too, wondering what's going on. So we have to understand how Christ cried out with his whole being. So he found them sleeping for sorrow. Then he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray. So I say to all of you brethren, you brethren around the world who hear this, rise and pray. Pray as you have never prayed before. Cry out to God, these things are real, lest you enter into temptation. No, you've got to put faith in God and walk and live by faith in a, pro in a profound way, or you won't make it. I'm not trying to frighten you, but I want to do, have you help stirred to do what God wants you to do, and I certainly hope that you will. So you need to read these scriptures on faith, how Jesus cried out with all of his beings and literally just cried out when agony. Notice key number four, exercise faith in all aspects of life, not just some aspects of life, but in all the aspects of life, brethren. You want to live by faith in every single facet of your life, not just in some, and I hope that you will. Turn with me now. Well, let me say some other things first here. You learn to swim by swimming. You don't learn to swim by reading a book about it. I know when I was first given the speech department in Ambassador College, some of the previous teachers had people read books. I was in their classes. This one guy didn't know how to speak that well himself, but he had, me, had us read books. Not wrong to read a book about speaking, but that was the main thing. I later then imitated the spokesman club, and it was just the ambassador club we had at that time. I had the suits get up and speech and evaluate each other and speak and speak and speak. You learn to swim by swimming. You learn to speak by speaking. And brethren, you learn to have faith by exercising faith in every little part of your lives on a continual basis. You've got to learn how to do that. You learn to have faith by loving all humanity. Don't just love your white Anglo-Saxon Celtic brethren. Just don't love your fellow black brethren. Don't just love your fellow women. Don't love your fellow males. Don't love people just like you. Don't love just Americans. Love every human being. Can we love the people in China? Absolutely. We don't need to love their form of government but we should have deep concern, think about what they're going through and ask God to have mercy on them. Ask God to help us reach into there. We're trying to do that and give them the truth. Some of them might be called out of that and certainly there are many of them are going to be in God's kingdom later. The people in Russia, the people in Africa, all over the world, try to have faith and learn by faith to love every one of them. Exercise faith in every part of your life. Exercise faith in loving your family God's way. Exercise faith by loving your wife. None of you be bitter against your wife, God tells the men. 
Don't let yourself get bitter. Your wife may make mistakes. She may talk too much. She may do this or that. Don't ever be bitter. Trust in God. Do it God's way. It takes a lot of faith for you ladies to submit yourself to your husband. Sometimes your husband doesn't seem to have as much wisdom or capacity that you do. But you've got to know that that is God's pattern. It will work out for the best in the end. It will. It always has. You walk by faith in loving your wife and loving your husband and loving your children and learn to train your children God's way. I'm surprised by so how many brethren, they don't really trust in God. They read these modern books about child rearing and about giving them everything and not ever correcting them. And then they're surprised how they have a bunch of little hoodlums. You've got to learn to do it God's way to know that the creator of heaven and earth, he put those things in here, train up a child in the way he should go the whole way of life. And when he is old, it never says he won't turn aside in the meantime for a few years, but when he is old, he will walk in it. That way of life will be ingrained in his brain. And if you teach him and train him, he will turn out much better than if you did not teach him and train him. God wants you to do that. God wants you to work hard. God tells you back in Ecclesiastes 9, if you want to turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. You're to learn to do whatever you do with all your heart. Work hard. Serve hard. Give of yourself to God hard. Don't do things halfway. That's one thing that God condemns the lay of his sins for, as you know. He says in Revelation 3, because you're neither cold nor hot, but lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. God doesn't want, want half-hearted people. He wants us to go all out. You know how these people in these rock concerts, they scream and yell like the guy up there yelling and screaming and with an electric guitar is some kind of a god. They're using their desire for worship the wrong way. Worship God that way. Worship him with your whole heart. Make your real hero to be Jesus Christ of Nazareth and give your life to him with a passion. Do all these things with the whole heart. And then certainly you want to trust God for healing. God is the healer. And I've given you several examples of that. I could give you many more. God has healed recently through many prayers of our ministers around the world even now. You say, why is he not healing more? Well, I've told you this before, and I've talked to many of our ministers around the United States that covered them even recently in the last few days. They acknowledge that somehow out there, there is a sort of a malaise. Our brethren are not wicked. They're not turning away from God. Everyone learns to just take things for granted. They're not stirred up by anything. Sometimes of you, without realizing it, I think in your mind, say, well, the young man in the sermonette talked about how we were preparing for the Christ coming way back in the 1970s and built the house of God. Well, it was completed in early 1974, and finally, the church turned aside completely about 20 years later. So God did give us that beautiful building to use for about 20 years, and finally, even after that, it was torn down. But, or misused, I should say. It's still there, but being misused. So he did let the church use it in a right way for a long time, humanly speaking. But we wonder why did God not, not keep it going a lot longer? Well, we know the fabulous temple that Solomon built was torn down brick by brick, utterly destroyed. Why? Because they had turned aside from God. Again, these things repeat themselves. They should not take from your faith, but give to your faith. But at any rate, the people who were back there could say, well, God didn't come. Christ didn't come then. What's wrong? The Lord delays his coming. No, he does not. Christ is not delaying his coming. We have had ideas in our head very sincerely. We have seen patterns in Scripture. We have seen dates that might work out. And because we really want it to be soon, that's fine. But we tend to set dates. But we're not doing it to hurt anyone. We're doing it to give people a sense of immediacy, a sense of imminency, that Christ's return is imminent. And that's okay as long as we don't misuse that. But don't get the idea that the Lord is not coming forever. These big things are happening, and they're going to continue to happen 
and I think you may be surprised yourself, many of you, though it's not in 100 years or something like that. I remember Billy Graham used to say, and I heard him say many times at different campaigns that I attended personally in Santa Barbara, California with Mr. Hapartian, in the Rose Bowl in Pasadena with Raymond McNair, in East Berlin, Germany, as it was at that time, or West Berlin, I should say, with Ernest Martin. I heard Billy Graham personally, and on his television program, he would say, Christ may come tonight. Give your heart to the Lord. He may come tonight. But he'd often say, on the other hand, that this great drama of human affairs may continue on a thousand years. I heard him say that many times. Wow, that's quite a stretch. We don't say that. There's no way it's going to continue a thousand years. We are near the end of a 6,000 year period. But looking into prophecy of recent date, you've heard us say we went d deeply into the meaning of this back in Second uh, Peter. And a day is with the Lord is a thousand years and so forth. And about, these things are about 7,000 years. We don't know the exact time. And all, our, all of our chronologists back at that time, Dr. Hay, Dr. Kuhn, Dr. Dorothy, and others that I talked to who are heavy into this, every one of them admitted we could be easily 30 or 40 years off. I've told you that before. We're not 40 years off. 40 years off would be another, what, 14 years. 9, 12, 20, 16, uh, until it would be another 24 years until 2040. So if we're off by some of our own understandings, but our understanding very easily could be wrong. But God is going to come back, and he's going to come back within the lifetimes of most of you. You must never give up on the fact that Christ will do what he said he will do. He gives you a list of events that are going to happen first. Notice that. He didn't give you a series of dates. Some of us in the church have, and we should apologize that we've overdone it. I know we had one guy setting dates. I better not mention his name. He had a, a little paper he used to call the flash. And so-and-so's flash. Well, it was the flash. You know, flash in the pan. It was all wrong. We said, well, he set this date, 1972, then it was at 1984, 1996, and 2004. He kept moving it forward. And some of our ministers said, well, if George, his name was not George, if George keeps setting a date like that, maybe he'll be right someday. That's right, you keep moving it ahead all the time. But that was his date, not God's date. So understand, Christ is coming. These big events are happening. And as you see the United States going down, as you say, the United States of Europe preparing, as you see the present European Union coming apart, and you're going to see that in the next several years. The present European Union is probably going to come apart. It's going to have to be rebuilt on a different foundation. And it will be built in union with the great false church. The great false church will move in there. They will be a moving factor. And impetus will probably be fighting the Muslims because more and more Muslims are coming into Europe and causing trouble. So then the king of the south will arise. And you'll have the king of the north and the king of the south. Well, you see those things happening, and you see even more things happening in the United States. When you see more drought, famine, and terrible disease epidemics, that those disease epidemics are going to cause people to have to choose. You choose to die, or you choose to trust in God, especially if God's called you. You have a choice. You've got to make that choice. You better start making it now to put your faith and trust in the God of Abraham the God of Isaac, and the God that gives these promises about healing in his word, so that you one way that you grow in faith is to learn to trust in God for healing. Along the way, you better show your faith in God by keeping the laws of health. I wrote the booklet years ago called The Seven Laws of Radiant Health. We haven't republished it. It was very simple, but yet I went through seven different things. Maybe we should republish those, those things, at least just the numbers of them, the very basic names. But, you know, part of it is to eat the right foods, get enough exercise, get enough sleep, think positive thoughts. One I put in there, avoid bodily injury. <laughs> Don't be careless. You can do all the good things in health. If you step out in front of the truck, it doesn't do any good. You're dead. So keep the laws of health. You are to do your part. But then above and beyond that, even though you don't do it perfectly, 
God knows you don't do any perfectly. I don't do anything perfectly. If he knows you're trying to glorify God in your body, then you turn to him with your whole heart like Jesus did. And you cry out to God and you mean it. Father, I've tried to glorify you in my body. I'm trying to live by this word. Heal me. Heal my little daughter. Heal my wife. Heal my friend. Heal, Father. You are the heal. And he will heal. <clears throat> we'll begin to have more miracles. <coughs> we'll begin to have more power than we've ever had. So we want to really understand that. Excuse me. So you want to do that part of God's <clears throat> way of faith as well, looking to God for healing. Also, brethren, you want to learn to trust God in tithing. Turn with me back to Malachi, if you would. Most of you know this, but sometimes we just ride right over these things, and uh, I hope that you will not do that. Turn back to Malachi the last book in your Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3. In Malachi chapter 3, he says in verse 7, return to me and I will return to you. You've got to learn to return to God. But you said, in what way shall we return? Verse 8, Malachi 3, verse 8. He says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. That's what God himself told. His word stands. It's in the Bible. Jesus constantly quoted the Old Testament as the word of God. You know that over and over again. It's inspired of God. You've robbed God in tithes, not just in tithes, but giving above and beyond your tithes and tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and prove me now on this, says the Eternal, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing. He's talking here to a whole nation, which he would do if we turn as a nation this way, that there will not be room to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. You know, back in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy, 4, Deuteronomy 20, the curses that were to come on modern Israel if we turned away from God, the devourer of these locusts and all these other plagues are going to come and ruin our crops. God said all that will be taken away if you'll turn back and start tithing, start obeying God. I'll rebuke the devourer so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear, bear her fruit for you. So God tells us that we have robbed him as a nation in tithes and offerings. And certainly we've got to be faithful to believe God, to do what God says in being very generous with God. God says, whatever you do with your might, he wants us to give him all that we can. And many of us in this work are trying to do that. I think you know that. And some of us right here in this room are trying to do that. Some of you brethren are not ministers. I'm not just talking about the ministers, but others. So give all you can, and God will bless you. You cannot outgive God. God is the great giver, and he will give back to you more than you have given to him. But you've got to, again, have faith that he is real and do that. And then you need to trust God for deliverance in all the trials that are ahead. We're going to have all kinds of trials and tests, as I've said, beyond what we've ever had in this nation. We're going to have race riots, we're going to have food riots, class riots, all kinds of things. We're going to have terrible disease epidemics sweeping through. People are going to be shaken. Where is God? God has withdrawn his blessings from this nation. He's withdrawn his guiding hand because we have turned away from again. That's why it said back here in Malachi, return to me and I will return to you. So we've got to learn to trust God for deliverance. He will deliver us just like he delivered the peoples of Judah in the time of Jehoshaphat. He caused these nations to turn on each other that were attacking Judah in a tremendous way, a miraculous way, awesome. Cannot understand it without a real God. And all the enemy were dead. It's an awesome way God intervened. And God will intervene way beyond what we can think of and imagine sometimes if we turn to him. 
So walk by faith, brethren, in every aspect of your lives. Walk and talk and live and trust God with all your being. Turn back with me, if you would now, to the book of Psalms. Turn back to the book of Psalms here. And in Psalm 32... Sorry, my feet. This book of Psalms, brethren, most of you know, is a tremendous book to study and to think on and to build faith if you really study it and understand it. It says here in Psalm chapter 32. He says in verse 7, you are my hiding place. And these troubles just ahead, we're going to have to know that God is real. Go to him. Trust him to take care of you. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you the way in which you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or mule which have no understanding, which be harnessed or else they will not come near. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked. We're going to see people suffer and suffer all around us. But he who trusts, there it is again, faith, where you walk by faith. But he who trusts in the ever-living one, mercy shall surround him. Think about that. What a wonderful promise. Mercy shall surround you. Be glad in the eternal and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all of you upright in heart. So that's another tremendous thing to help us learn to trust in God and to be very thankful for what God is doing. Now let's turn one more time back to where we started. Turn back here again, brethren, to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And I want to read something here again. This is, again, one of my favorite passages, and I hope it will become one of yours. Hebrews chapter 10, and beginning in verse 34. He's writing here to the peoples of the, of the Jews in Israel at the, just before the great suffering they went through. Everything indicates this book was written just before the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D., and the people had to have faith in God. He says, therefore, do not cast away your confidence. You've gone through trials and tests. God seems way off to some of you, which you must have thought down even back then when terrible things were happening. Some of the Christians were being persecuted and thrown in jail, beaten up. They said, where is God? Don't give up, he said. Never, 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 ever give up. Don't do that. Don't cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come. As I've said, God will do what he has said that he will do, and nothing can stop that. Nothing. God will come back as he said he will. He who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. I've given you some pointers on how to walk and to live by faith. I hope that you will use those in your lives. The just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to destruction or perdition, but of those who believe we have faith to the saving of the soul. God help every one of you to focus on faith. God help you, brethren, around the world to grow in faith, to use faith in every phase and facet of your life. And as the people of God, the church of God at the end of the age, to so learn in every way you can, in every part of your lives, to live and to walk by faith.